You are listening to the Intrepid Radio Program with Scotty Roberts. Intelligent Talk. Well, happy Thursday evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Scotty Roberts right here on the Intrepid Radio Program here on the Odyssey Radio Network. And if you want to go hear the radio show in audio format and how it broadcasts out to all our affiliates, you can go to odyssey1.com. That's O-D-Y-S-Y-1 dot com. Or you can come on over to my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. And you can join in the live chat room and you can see the live simulcast video. Now, the video doesn't have lots of dancing and pretty shows and pictures and all of that and great animations. It's pretty much just me talking. But if you want to come over and join the live chat uh, over on the live stream, then you'll get a chance to interact with other people who listen to the show. And thank you for being here tonight. I want to talk about some of the stuff that we were talking about yesterday, and I kind of want to jump right into it. Uh, This whole idea, this psychology of social media and the things we do. And, And I'll tell you what, folks, I am a social media maven. Well, to a certain extent. I don't do all the things that everybody does out there. I'm basically a Facebook guy, sometimes a Twitter guy. I do Instagram, things like that. I promote things on my Facebook. I sometimes promote things on my Twitter and my Instagram, but I enjoy keeping up with people. I enjoy throwing up pictures. I have said a long time ago, somebody said, why do you take pictures of yourself, selfies, and put them up? Why do you put up pictures of you and your family? Why do you do all this stuff? Because, you know what? I want my kids someday to be able to look back and say, who was my dad? I know him, or my grandkids, or my great-grandkids. Someday there's going to be a day where somebody looks back. And you know what this came off of? It was off of a time about 25 to 30 years ago when I started doing some genealogical research into my own family. Our family was so broken up by divorces and things like that and people not talking to each other in previous generations that finding information was really slim to none. Uh, My dad, he didn't know much. He was pretty detached from the family. Uh, My grandma on my dad's side didn't know much. My grandmother on my mom's side died 30 years ago almost. And so, you know, trying to get information from people was nuts. So I would come up, even today, after all the research I've done, I've come up with about four or five pictures from my past and from my history. My great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, my grandfather, who I found out was on my paternal side, died at age 21 in a sanatorium in Kentucky of tuberculosis. And he died when my dad, who is now 80 years old, was six weeks old. So technically, my grandfather could still be alive today. He'd be, you know, I don't know, he'd be 101. Maybe he wouldn't be. But people have lived to be 101. Uh, I used to say over the last 10 to 20 years, oh, my grandfather could still be alive if he hadn't succumbed to tuberculosis at such a young age. I look at that now. I'm almost, almost three times the age my grandfather lived to be. So he died as a 21-year-old kid. And at my age, 21 as a kid. Sorry, 21-year-olds. But I say this to say, as I did research, I found one photograph of my grandfather out there. Um, I found one photograph of my great-grandfather who was murdered in a political debate on election day back in 1926 in Ohio somewhere, a small town. Oh, no, it might have been Kentucky. Uh, he was murdered 
because one of his friends disagreed with him, went out and got a shotgun, came back to where they were all hanging out at the post office, which was also the five and dime, and they were all sitting drinking soda pops. And his friend came back and confronted him over his political opinions. Now, I don't know what side of my grandfather was on, uh, left or right or somewhere in between, but they had an argument and he got shot in the chest and died an hour later. Uh, he was uh, age right around 30, 32, something like that. Maybe not even 30. So I look at these things and I say, I have scant photos, scant information. So when I take a selfie, when I post on my social network pictures of my kids and my family, when we've got our walls filled with pictures and I love my wife for doing that. She's taken a lot of the pictures and put them in frames, blown them up, and they're all over the wall in the living room. And I do that because I want my kids to know who I am. Now, my children know who I am fairly well, but wouldn't it be nice when I'm gone and my kids are grown up that they're able to look back and say, ah, here's pictures of my dad and me. Here's my dad and my mom together. Here's our family together. Wouldn't it be nice for my grandkids to do that, for my great-grandkids to be able to do that? That's why I do this stuff. I treat Facebook as an archive of sorts. Uh, now, who knows? That's not going to be there forever. That may someday be wiped out. That database exists, though. So I've got all of that stuff on my computer as well. And so I want that stuff to be memorials of me to my kids. The things I say, the things I think, the way I dressed on a certain day. Uh, that's all important information, as far as I'm concerned, for my offspring, my progeny, my legacy, if you will. Many of us, we don't have legacies like presidents of the United States or rulers of countries or great and grand and glorious things we've done. Many of us, our legacy is simply who we were, who we are now, what our relatives will remember, our offspring will remember us as. That's our legacy. It's leaving behind. I like the fact that some of my kids are so creative. And to me, that's a, a living legacy of what I've bequeathed to my children. Um, I remember when my daughters were little, my twin daughters, my oldest, we used to sit and color pictures. I had a big seven-foot-long table in my office at standing height. Uh, it was actually it was an old door, a solid door that I put into a niche in the basement that was seven feet wide perfectly. I think I trimmed a little bit off of one end. And I put that big door down in my studio in the basement when my twin daughters, who are now 27, were like three and four years old. And they would sit, I would stand and draw in the middle, draw and paint and ink things and stuff like that for my job. And my kids would sit on either side of me on that table, which was the door, so you can think of the dimensions. And they would sit on either side, laying on their tummies on the table, their feet up in the air behind them, and sitting and drawing pictures along with Dad. That stuff stuck. I see my son Flynn now, my 10-year-old boy, highly creative. We just did some sculpting this weekend. He likes to draw pictures. Uh, and all it, these are the things we pass on to our kids. And those are the living legacies, if you will. And so when you start to take this into Internet, our presences on social media, which we talked about last night, uh, these are the things that we, why do we go there? We have to ask ourselves the question, why do we do this on social media? Why do I want to show my family off? on my social media, con uh, con in the content of my social media accounts? Why do I want to show off my wife? Why do I want to show off my children, my older children's accomplishments? Why do I want to show that stuff off? Why do I want to show a picture of my face in the sun? Uh, why do I do that? Because I want people to know who I am. There's an innate need in all of us to have people recognize us for who we are. I'm not talking about moments in the spotlight or great fame or wanting people to know us because we're great individuals to know. It's just saying, look, I'm out here and there's a need inside of me to not just live alone in a cave. If I wanted that, that's what I'd be doing in life. 
but I like to share my life with people. I'm an open book. I want people to know who know me, or at least even superficially know me on the internet. There is some need deep back inside of my head that says, I would like you to know who I am. Uh, I may argue with somebody about politics on the internet, but is that who I am? If somebody calls me a blithering moron on the internet, is that what I am? Is that the definition of who Scotty Roberts is? No. And so you put those things out there. We all have certain needs that we try to meet by putting things out there about ourselves. I think there is a great call to counter loneliness. And we're going to talk about that in great depth today. Well, as much depth as we can do in an hour-long radio show. We all have this certain loneliness that drives us to do things, to socialize with people, to know who people are. And the Internet has made it very easy to attach ourselves to people, at least on a superficial level. So sometimes that's for good, sometimes it's for ill, that we get ourselves involved in those things. But if you keep it in a proper perspective, it's something that is good for us. It answers a need that's deep within us. And so I want to ask you today, as you're listening to me, what inside you drives you? And maybe you don't even see it as a drive. What gives you any kind of animus at all to go on social media, to share elements of your life, aspects of your life, with people you don't really know? You think you know them, I think I have a lot of friends on Facebook. Now, nobody take any offense at this. Facebook and Instagram, my social medias, I know a lot of people, and a lot of those things for me, they overlap each other with the same people. I think that there are people who gotten to know me pretty well, and I think I know them pretty well. But there is somebody, even this last week, who was somebody I've chatted with little bits and pieces, not great amounts of time, and then I learned something about their life that's just dastardly and devastating and something they're going through that little bit eked through the cracks. And so I asked the question with all sincerity, what's up? What's going on? And uh, they gave me a little bit of information. And so what is it that drives you to go to the Internet, to go into social media? Now, I know a few of you who come and listen to the show even and chat in this chat room. You don't, uh, you don't do the social media anymore. You stay away from it. What has kept you away from that? Was it a bad experience there? Was it you are more an introverted person or more of a quiet person or a personal private person? You don't want to share all that junk with the rest of the world. But what is it that makes a place like Facebook have, I don't even know what the current number is, have billions of followers? around the world. Now, granted, some of those people have more than one uh, account over there doing different... I've got two or three different pages that I've put up, but they're all under my name. You know, the Paradigm Symposium page, the Paradigm Intrepid Paradigm page, the Intrepid Magazine page, the History Trippers page, my Art and Design page. These are all pages that I have, but they're all under me, Scott Roberts, Scotty Roberts over on Facebook. But what's the drive? Why do people out there in the multiple millions need to have a social media? Why do younger people, especially growing up now, have to have that little handheld device that they carry with them everywhere and always attach to that social media? Some of it's for work. I know my own daughters. Sometimes I go out to eat with them and they're on their things because there's constant messages coming in on their business. Sometimes they put it down, sometimes they have to answer things. We addressed that a little bit yesterday. So the big question I want to ask you, what drives you to social media? Let me ask you this question that might be a little more probing. What is your loneliness? What is the thing inside of you? What is, uh, and I've mentioned this before, when I was in ministry, we used to say, we all have, theologically speaking, and this was more a word picture in theology, I'd say we all have a God-shaped vacuum in our hearts that only God can fill. 
to a tenth degree. We try to fill it with all different kinds of things, and it doesn't fit, and we shake, turn it upside down and shake it out, and we're still empty. What is that thing that needs to fill that, that God-shaped vacuum? So I would ask you, dig a little deep yourself. What is that vacuum in your heart that hasn't been filled yet, that you're seeking every day to fill? Uh, not fulfill. That's different. That's goals and accomplishments. What's the thing that's missing for you? Is that what drives you to the Internet? Now, all of this is saying is not saying the Internet is a bad place to be. It can be for some people. For other people, it's a great thing. I talked yesterday about all the negatives that we have psych psychologically that bring us into social media. Yet, at the same time, I can find lots of friends I have from the Internet. People I've gotten to know. One of my best friends in the world was John Ward. And all of you know we wrote a book together. I traveled to Egypt with him many times. He's an archaeologist with his wife in Egypt. Um, and we got to know each other, you know where? Met on the Internet back in about 2010 or 11. And uh, we started talking every day on Skype, visual talking. We'd have a cup of coffee and a smoke every day. Him with the Theban Mountains in his background from his rooftop garden, which I mentioned yesterday, uh, and me from my office or sitting outside. And that's how we got to know each other. And you know where? Facebook, social media. And we became the best of friends. He's the one who had that little statue over my shoulder here of Senenmut carved for me as we wrote our book about those topics. So good friends can be made. Good friends can be lost. Uh, I had a friend of mine of 25 plus years, uh, and we were very close. We did a lot of stuff together. I've mentioned him before, too. Our wives and, and I, my ex-wife at the time, uh, back in 1993, we all met, we all got together, we all hung out. We all had great times together for years and years. And the last time I really saw him with any substance was about four or five years ago when John Ward was in town and I wanted him to come over. We had a big cookout. We talked. Then he and I, this friend of mine of 25 plus years, we talked about a book he wanted to write and we were trying to collaborate on that. And co we always collaborated on ideas. We had a little business together. Three Kelton Company, back in the 90s and the early 2000s, where we sold Irish, Scottish, Welsh, English goods, kilts, books, jewelry, swords, imprinted t-shirts, things that we made ourselves, and we went and did all the heritage shows together. All that to say, this was a good friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, who, after the election of Donald Trump, uh, didn't like the way I voted, and parted ways with me, even called me a Nazi uh, in doing it, and hasn't spoken to me since. It's been a couple of years now, and uh, was very nasty about it. Nothing had come up between us that was adverse uh, or, or creating adversity. We didn't have any problems with each other except that. So, and he, and a lot of this happened through social media. He didn't end our friendship. Uh, face to face, which I asked for. I said, hey, how about a cup of coffee? Let's go out and talk. What's going on? And uh, no, I never want to see your face again. And, and where, where do you think this was done? Social media, email, stuff like that. No courage to words, no courage to look me in the eyes because he had to remove, as we said last night, I removed the emotion of it. So I have to ask you, in light of that, I rabbit trailed on that little story a bit. But I want to ask you, what are the things that drive you to look for things in social media, to look for those contacts, to find that interaction? There are some of you here in the chat room tonight, and I love the fact that you spend your time here with me uh, chatting about this stuff, and some of you in other places as well. But what drives you here? What is it that gives you the time to want to be here? It doesn't have to be a negative, but it could be something that you say, there is something inside of me that I'm trying to fill, that I'm trying to fulfill a need to a certain extent, or I'm trying to fill a gap that is there. And again, don't look at it as negative. I don't want you all to go away now. 
<laughs> and say, oh, I got better things to do. You're right. That's not the point I'm trying to make. The point I want, I'm trying to make is to get you to look inward and say, what, what makes me want to be here? Am I lonely? Am I missing something? Is there a gap of some kind in my existence? What is it? And so I want to talk a little bit, and we're going to, and we've only got a few minutes left in this first segment, believe it or not. But uh, I'm going to start it now, but then pick it up after the break. I want to talk about the whole idea of social media and the psychology of loneliness, the things that make us lonely in life. I remember a song from a, a Christian songwriter when, uh, back when I was in ministry days, and we did a lot of his music with the youth group, Wayne Watson. And he had a song, and the lyrics of the song were, It's good to be lonely every now and again, to be parted from the ones you adore, to sit at a table for two all alone, and take a look at the world around you, at people who have no one to go home to, some with no place to belong, others consumed by their weakness, and others when weak seem so strong. And then in his chorus of the song, he said, Lord, help me. Uh, 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 feel content wherever I am. Um, and this was the message of his song. And so is it good to be lonely for you? Sometimes I like being lonely. Sometimes. I love my children. I love my wife. But when my wife takes the kids and say, we're, we're going on a little overnight or we're, we're going to go up to grandma's for a couple of days up at the lake, I'm like, nice. I get to sit home and be alone for a while. Sometimes that's nice. But there's a psychology of social media and loneliness that I want you to consider. Uh, Norman Cousins, in his book Modern Man is Obsolete, said, All man's history is an endeavor to shatter his loneliness. Do you agree with that statement? Is all of our history an endeavor to shatter our loneliness? To get away from the things? Sometimes... We are with people all the time and incredibly lonely. Is this what drives people to social media? What is it that makes you lonely? You can have a wonderful family, people that love you and that you love, yet you can still be incredibly lonely. What's the psychology of that? What drives us? In today's world, what drives us? You would think there'd be no reason for anybody to be lonely with all the technologies that are built to connect us today, our cell phones. And again, this hails back to a couple nights ago when I was talking about the nostalgia of growing up without the technology that we have. We found different avenues for taking care of that loneliness and for socializing. But look at all the things we have that are built to connect us. Loneliness, one would think, would be easily shattered and easily done away with. But the more we get drawn into the virtual worlds of social media, the worse we tend to feel. Have you noticed that? To, to account for the... And maybe some of you who've stopped being on social media, you've hit had hit this square in the face. The brick wall of knowing that the longer I'm on social media, the more loneliness I feel. What is that? What's the psychology of that? So let's take a look at that after we come back from the break. Folks, you're listening to the Intrepid Radio Program. I'm Scotty Roberts. I'm going to be gone for two minutes, and I'll be right back. So sit tight.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from that break. We are now in the second segment of the Intrepid Radio Program. With me, your host, Scotty Roberts, here on the Odyssey Radio Network. You can go hear the audio version of this that gets doled out to all our different uh, uh, outlets and uh, different terrestrial stations, uh, iHeartRadio, uh, Spreaker, all of those different things. But you can go find the raw audio over at Odyssey One. Dot com o d y s y one dot com. You can also go uh, come and listen to the. Why am I just going blank? I have no idea. Uh, the words are right there on the edge of my head. Uh, come on over and see the simulcast video over on my YouTube stream, and that's over at youtube.com slash Mister Scotty Roberts. Mister, all spelled out. And I want to ask you if you are there and you are not subscribed to my channel, please subscribe to my channel. There's a subscribe button somewhere around here. And then after you hit subscribe, there's that little bell icon. Click on that for notifications for when we go live, which is usually always 10 p.m. Central... I'm sorry, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, 9 p.m. Central Standard Time, five nights a week, Monday through Friday. And there are several. You can go check the schedule at odyssey1.com. And you can see when all the uh, different uh, uh, encore uh, playings of each episode every day play throughout the day and the night. So I want to thank you for being here. So like this video on your way out. Subscribe if you're not subscribed. Share it with your friends if you like it. I'd like to get uh, my channel up to over a thousand subscribers. And once we do that, that we enter in a whole new category of things we can do with this show over on the YouTube video stream. And it helps me to perhaps monetize the channel a bit. So go ahead and do that for me. I appreciate it. Like the video, share it, subscribe, hit the bell. There we go. We covered it. And you can go over to my website, which is scrolling right down here below. You'll see scottallenroberts.com. You'll see Son of a Patriot. All of those things, those are all my sites. So go over there and take a peek, see what I do. Uh, if you need art and design, illustration work, uh, if you want some great t-shirt designs uh, and hoodies and coffee mugs and stuff like that, go over and see it. And all the, also, by the way, I want to mention, right now at about, you know, it's now uh, uh, 9.30 Central Standard Time, in one and a half hours, uh, I will be on live with Rocky Stucci on this same network. You can see it simulcast on his YouTube channel or go over to odyssey1.com for the audio and The Situation Room with Rocky Stucci. And we'll be going at it again tonight at 11 p.m. Central Standard Time, midnight Eastern Time, which makes this the Friday show for The Situation Room. All right, everybody. So there, all the business out of the way. Let's get right back into where we left off. I'm asking you to consider what are the things that drive you to the Internet? What are the things that are the lonelinesses in you that make you look for something somewhere else? Sometimes we look right past the things right under our noses and we look to other things to try to fulfill certain needs. Um, we, we get drawn into these virtual worlds of social media, Facebook, I could name them all off. Facebook, Twitter, you know, Instagram, uh, Tumblr, uh, LinkedIn, to a certain extent, is a social media group for people doing business. Uh, so all of these things exist. And, and what is it that draws us into those? And the, the worse we tend to feel, the things that, that that makes us feel, are we still looking for something else? Has it fulfilled a need or has it exposed in you the need for more? The need for something to cover something up? Is social media something that's fulfilling that for you? Filling that hole in your soul or your heart or the gap in your life? Or is it something that's defining it greater? So you feel it harder and more harsher. And it's suggested that the medium, social media, is the problem. We've become over-reliant on connecting through our devices at the expense of more traditional ways of social interaction. We talked about that quite a bit last night. But while there's likely some truth to the assertion in this, uh, 
the argument that I'm putting forward is that there's an inner emptiness to all of us or the lack of a well-defined and effectual sense of who we are, of self, if you will. I'm not talking about self-esteem, those big trigger words that uh, Phil Donahue, if anybody even remembers who he is, uh, from 30 and 40 years ago, made made me huge. Uh, but what's the root cause of loneliness experienced by so many uh, nowadays? Uh, our sense of self about who we are can be seen as existing on the spectrum. On the one side of the spectrum are those with this strong sense of self. Such people feel they have a place in the world and they know what they want in their lives and they take the necessary actions to move in the directions of their goals. You know them. They don't have to all be type A personalities, that strong, assertive individual, but they could just be people who know where they are in life. They're way over here on this end of the goal of the spectrum. They know their goals and they aim for them. On the totally other end of the spectrum are people with a weak sense of self. These are the empty men and women. Uh, these are individuals who lack this clear conception of what they want with their life. They kind of fumble around through things. Now, it's not saying that people with goals don't fumble around testing things out and trying things, but these are people on this end that have no idea where they want to be. Uh, they have no long-term goals around which they structure their days. They don't hang their hats on any hooks. And so they feel this powerlessness to positively influence their own situation. Sometimes that's driven by externals. Sometimes it's driven by poverty. Or maybe we're not impoverished. Sometimes it's driven by the lack of getting beyond where you are. There are certain brick walls you hit in life and you can't move beyond them. You could be those people who have great ideas for something, but you can't implement them because you don't have the tools or the finances or the things like that. Those could be people closer to that end of the spectrum. Uh, these are people who tend to drift through life on that far end in this kind of passive manner. Uh, they follow the path of least resistance. Uh, they're crippled by doubt. The essential doubt that is at the core of all of us. Do we enact that doubt? Do we actualize it and make that be the flow of our life? Or do we try to slip over to that other end of the spectrum and somewhere along the way in between gain that idea that there's nothing I'm going to allow to hold me down or hold me back? This is where I, I look at one of my favorite quotes from Mark Twain, and over the years it's become almost my moniker for life, where he says, 20 years from now, you've heard me say this before, 20 years from now, you'll regret more the things you didn't do than the things you did do. Think about that for a second. If you're old enough, look back 20 years and ask yourself, what were my goals 20 years ago? What were the things I wanted to do and accomplish? Have I done those? Have I worked toward them? Am I in the midst of them? Am I still planning them? Or am I regretting that I didn't do them? So he said, 20 years from now, you'll regret more the things you didn't do than the things you did do. So, cast away from the safe harbor. Set your sails to the trade winds. Explore, dream, discover. This is what he said. There's almost a, it doesn't have to be reckless, but I wanted to use the phrase because it's a great phrase. There's almost a reckless abandon to it. It's one of saying, if I don't do these things now, I'm not going to get there. So you find ways to make them happen. You know, our list of excuses for not doing the things that fulfill the things we wish we could accomplish to fill that gap maybe a little bit, to move on into the things we dream about that we want to explore. What are the things that hold us back? Make up your excuse list. I'd love to see your excuse list. If you're here in the chat room, give me some of your excuses for not doing the things you want to do. And I mean it that way. I mean it to sound that way. Go ahead. Lay your excuses on me because that's all they are. They're excuses. 
Yeah, some of them might be real world things. I don't have the money to do that. Well, there's ways to get around that, you know. And I'm not talking about robbing a bank. Uh, it's like I always wanted to go to Egypt, and when I finally did, um, you know what it cost me? A lot less than I thought it would. And uh, there were also uh, um, things that we did to make that work. Uh, so achieving goals. What's your list of excuses for not doing it? What are the things, excuses that are going to leave you 20 and 30 years from now saying, oh, I wish I'd have done that thing instead of grabbing it and doing it? So the problem of emptiness, which now is almost an affliction, especially in Western culture, is a symptom of a society in a period of flux. For one's selfhood or lack thereof it's influenced by the social structures of one's day. In the West, many of the institutions which in the past helped people find their place in the world have fallen to the wayside. The decline of the church, of religion, that has gone on a decline. It's not saying there aren't faithful people out there, but even people like me who was in the church, was a minister in the church, have had my doubts and my problems, and I've moved away from that. For certain reasons. And that is a pandemic, if you will, in society. Many people don't take it to the levels that I have taken it, where I want to study things and know, and studying those things and knowing makes me doubt and question them, makes me move away from them. Many people just aren't into it anymore. They don't have to take it to some deep academic level. Um, so the, the, the West is lacking a religious, a cultural mythology, if you will, to which people can turn in order to find a place in the world and a meaning to their life. If you grew up believing the, and I use the, the word myth as a descriptor, not as a complete definition of, so don't get offended by that or have your sensibilities offended, but the religious mythology that we have in our life that we've set up to say, this is what guides me, this is what gives me hope, this is what I drive toward. If you've got that mythology and it's lost its meaning, um, your life tends to go adrift. You don't know where you are anymore. You've stepped outside the circle. You've left the box, so to speak. And the growth of the state has also been a force that's contributed to this pathology of emptiness. Now, I'm not talking just politics here. I'm talking about the growth of the state the, the intrusion of the state in our lives. Uh, the rise of the state has led to the destruction of smaller communities. The degradation of the family unit, which for thousands of years has been integral, an integral force in the development of one's selfhood. What do we say is one of the most atrocious outcomes of severe poverty? Uh, in our inner cities. And by the way, when I talk severe poverty in the United States, it's different than severe, uh, 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 severe poverty in some third world countries. But even in our own country, in the West here, in Western culture, which is mostly who my listeners are, uh, third world countries don't usually listen to shows like this on the internet, on their laptops, in, on the internet, in their hovels. They don't have it. This is usually Western, first, uh, first world culture, first world problems, if you will. So it's usually in that circle of people that we find uh, that, that kind of social circle is, is what I'm trying to say. I'm struggling in my brain with what I said to make sure it sounded right or it came across right. That's where we find these problems. That's where we find that, that there is this push from the outside, from the externals, that keep us from fulfilling what's inside. You know, we also used to say there's a spiritual factor to this. When I was in ministry, I remember my old pastor friend, Parson Larson, I called him, uh, Pastor Larson. He said once in a message on a Sunday morning, he said, you know, and it was in context to what he was talking about, he said, if the devil can't make you bad, he'll make you busy. 
And this is something that I've adapted for what I talk about and the things I talk about in life, the things I deal with. If the devil can't make me bad, he'll make me busy. In other words, take the devil factor out of it. Take the theology out of it and just say, um, ask yourself, what are the things? What are the, There's a fly flying around here. He was up close to the camera. For those of you watching, you may have seen a big black blob fly across my camera lens. That was a fly that's loose in here. So uh, that fly is, is, is a lot like uh, uh, the things that distract us. So what is it distracts you from your goal? What is it dis- that distracts you in life? What is it that throws you off? What's the integral force from the outside that keeps you from fulfilling what you're trying to do? You have to find that. You have to identify that. It's sometimes hard. It's sometimes very easy. These are the things that hold me back. Now, I am not promoting, and in no way promote, well, I think I'll just leave my wife and kids, or my husband and kids, and go pursue my goals, because my family's not happy if there's not a happy me. What a big, stinking, bullshit lie we've been fed in our culture. Oh, I can't be happy for my family, with my family, if I'm not, I have to go seek my happiness first. And I say it that way because, you know what? There are certain sacrifices you make when you have families, when you have kids. And those sacrifices are sometimes blessed sacrifices. There are things I say, when I make the choice to go this way, I am turning my back on going this way. Or I'm putting a pause on it. I'm in a parenthetical stage. When I decided to get married and have kids, and I've had six of them now, Do you think that changed some of my goals in life? Before I had any kids at all, before I met my my wife, with whom I had my first three kids, I remember sitting in my pastor's office and telling him, I want to just get a nice camera. I want to get a backpack with a couple of changes of clothes. I want to stock up my, my credit card account. And this is before, you know, debit cards and all of that. I'm talking, this is uh, the late 80s when I had this conversation. I said, I just want to go. I want to take a boat or a plane or something over to Europe, and I want to just start trekking. And that's what I want to do with my life. And I want to take pictures, and I want to maybe write a book when I'm done doing that and settle down. Would my life have been very different had I done that? Yeah. But you know what happened? Within weeks after having that conversation... I met my first wife, fell madly head and heels over love, over her in love, and I made choices. That choice was settle down, get married, uh, have kids. That changed my entire life. Now, do I regret not having made that trek back when I was in my mid-twenties? Yeah, sometimes. Uh, But I've done other things. I've made choices to go this direction. And so these are choices we have to make. Sometimes we have to, uh, uh, we used to say also when I was in ministry, never sacrifice the eternal on the altar of the immediate. Don't do, don't ruin the future in a moment of expediency. Now I will say that about affairs. People who have affairs of the heart, sexual affairs, things like that. That's a touchy area. Um, Just look at uh, Ilian Omar. No politics here on this show. Just saying if you want to read about it, there's more information there. So when you make a mistake like that, do you change the rest of your course of life? Do you sacrifice the lasting, meaningful things on the altar of the immediate and the expedient. Because, all oh, this looks good, feels good, fills that hole in my heart that's missing something. Well, so is the onus on us to find things to fill it externally, or do we look for the things that have to fit within the grid work of what we've created in order to fulfill those things? Those are big questions, and these are questions you have to ask yourself because you can see 
There's all kinds of tributaries and little coolies and creeks that run off the main channel of this river. Uh, what's really exacerbated this problem, uh, especially for the younger generations now, are the unfavorable economic conditions. Even if one struggles to find a deeper meaning to their life uh, in the mid to late 20th century into the 21st century, I say mid to late 20th because that's where I started this. If you look to find that deeper meaning, at least one could fall back on the so-called American dream. And by establishing this stable career, you get the career, you build the home, you this is what you do when you're young. You invest your money well so that when you're 60 to 65 to 70, uh, you're not worrying about where your money is. You purchase a home, you raise a family, you develop a more or less adequate sense of self. But self is being built around all these externals. But for the most part, this dream is dead for younger generations, it seems. It's the confluence of all these forces as created as a society that's full of hollow men and women. This is what we need. This is what we cannot achieve. So a, so a society that's afflicted by a pathology of emptiness is also a society that's full of anxiety and anxiety-ridden individuals. You people go out, uh, all of you listening tonight, you go to your workplaces or the places where you encounter the most people in your day-to-day -day lives. Do you feel the anxiety out there? Anybody you know have anxiety? Do you have anxiety? What causes that? If we feel ourself to be powerless to exert control over our lives and the uncertainty of our ability to face up to the challenge of our environment, then anxiety is this natural response. And for the hollow man or hollow woman, this anxiety is most strongly felt during periods of solitude. Our lonelinesses, when we're alone or we feel we're alone, and we feel those things. Do people who are... Now, I know there's lots of variables. I'm just bringing this up as a random thought. Do people who are surrounded by friends and give themselves in those relationships, even though they have certain anxieties, are those the people we find generally wanting to end their lives? Or does that happen in the solitude, in the emptiness that comes after those times, that comes in between and fills all the gaps. It's like taking a series of bricks and settling them into the mud, and each brick represents something else that is a good thing in our life, but as we press those down into the mud, the mud comes oozing up through the gaps and overflows onto the surface of the bricks. Is that what you're like? Is that what your life is like? This isn't a show about suicide. It's a show about emptiness. But does suicide come because there's emptiness? There's a sense of loneliness? If we have no other people around to lean on or to distract us, then our thoughts turn inward. And this leads to the hollowed out feeling, the hollowed out people among us, to become aware of the, and we become more and more aware of the inner void. Therefore, unlike an individual with a strong um, and individuated, uh, individuated sense of self for whom periods of solitude can be rejuvenating. Solitude for the hollow person is an experience as painful and uh, as painfully lonely and sometimes something that has to be fled from. Are you, look at yourself and ask yourself the question, is my need for social attention based on the, an inner hollowness, an emptiness that I can't fill somewhere else? In generations past, the hollow person would turn to the comfort and the security of friends and family, or they'd take part in social events. They avoid the anxiety that was triggered in times of solitude. Now, it's not saying they can eradicate the anxiety, 
They kind of move it aside. They fill that anxiety hole with other things. It's their solitude that triggers it. But in the present day, we don't even need to leave the comfort of our home to find the social connections necessary to block out the awareness of our emptiness. Instead, we merely need to turn to the comfort glow of our phones, our handheld devices, our laptops and our computers, and immerse ourselves in what we referred to last night as the virtual world's of social media, that virtual, almost real, but not quite real. I think of uh, Miracle Max from The Princess Bride, Billy Crystal. He's not dead. He's almost dead. And it's, this is not real. It's, it's almost real, but it's not real. It's virtual. We can even go so far as to construct this pseudo self to mask over our empty nature. We selectively post bits of information about ourselves about our life online so we can pretend to be someone we're not and we feed off the social validation offered by the others who participate in this game i'm going to tell you there's somebody and i'm not going to name this person because some of you may know who this is there was somebody who back before i met rainy about 15 to 20 years ago i had somebody that was a very strong social connection for me and we're talking almost 20 years ago Now, this person is still my friend. But at the time when I met this person, they masqueraded as a completely imaginary person that they made up. I don't know if it was a personal experiment or a a personal mental something, but this person did that. And then they ended up sucking my kids even into it. And I allowed that to happen because we talk online. It was always in text. But... I will tell you this, and it was an unspoken thing, and it still remains unaddressed. Even though I know who this person is, I think they know I know, Uh, long about 15 years ago, they killed off this imaginary person, and they posed as somebody that was close to that person. And so what did I do? I allowed myself to be sucked into something like that, and even my older kids were sucked into it at the time. I was a single dad raising three kids on my own, of whom I had sole custody. And I was sucked right into that. Now, I'm trying to encapsulate it. I didn't even know I was going to mention that today. Uh, So that's not the full story. But to say that indicates that even I was in a place where I come from talking about this stuff because I've been there and I know and I understand it. And why we do these things. This was a person who selectively posted fake things about themselves to create another persona. And then found themselves soon in trouble and had to kill it off. And then there was me who sucked right into it at the time. Uh, They want that validation. They have a game that they play. And this defensive mechanism that's used by the hollow person, the hollow man, the hollow woman, whereby they flee to comfort the crowd to avoid the anxiety triggered in times of solitude is also utilized by pre-psychotic individuals in the attempt to avoid a psychotic break. In this magnus opus interpretation of schizophrenia, Silvano Arietti describes how this process unfolds in the case of schizophrenics. And I've only got a minute left, so I'm going to go this quick. He said, in some cases, schizophrenical, uh, it's a version of the word I've not used, Uh, schizophrenial starts, schizophrenia, I'm sorry, it was in brackets, starts with a period of confusion, excitement, and agitation. The person seems to be eager to make contacts to reach all the people he knows, to reconnect himself with what seems to be an escaping world. He searches for something that he cannot find. And that's what many people do with social media. What's the schizophrenic searching for? It's also the same thing that the hollow person lacks, a secure sense of self. And i got to kind of leave off on this. We'll pick this up again tomorrow. But 
I want to leave by restating the question, who are you? Are you hollow? Are you lonely? What is it that drives you to social media? There are good things about social media, but there are also very bad things. So ask yourself those questions, and we'll discuss it more tomorrow. I want to thank you for being here. We'll be back tomorrow night. So after this 23-hour break, be right there, and we'll be right back.